forward. This book, my last, was begun more than 10 years ago. I first got the idea of writing it from C. Kranji's essay on the Aegean Festival in Goddard's Faust. The literary prototype of this festival is the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, itself a product of the traditional Irogalmos symbolism of alchemy. I felt tempted at the time to comment on Kiranyi's essay from the standpoint of alchemy and psychology, but soon discovered that the theme was far too extensive to be dealt with in a couple of pages. Although the work was soon underway, more than ten years were to pass before I was able to collect and arrange all the material relevant to this central problem. As may be known, I showed in my book Psychology and Alchemy, first published in 1944, how certain archetypal motifs that are common in alchemy appear in the dreams of modern individuals who have no knowledge of alchemical literature. In that book, the wealth of ideas and symbols that lie hidden in the neglected treatises of this much misunderstood art was hinted at rather than described in the detail it deserved. For my primary aim was to demonstrate that the world of alchemical symbols definitely does not belong to the rubbish heap of the past, but stands in a very real and living relationship to our most recent discoveries concerning the psychology of the unconscious. Not only does this Modern psychological discipline give us the key to the secrets of alchemy, but conversely, alchemy provides the psychology of the unconscious with a meaningful historical basis. This was hardly a popular subject, and for that reason, it remained largely misunderstood. Not only was alchemy almost entirely unknown as a branch of natural philosophy and as a religious movement, but most people were unfamiliar with the modern discovery of the archetypes, or had at least misunderstood them. Indeed, there were not a few who regarded them as a sheer fantasy, although the well-known example of whole numbers, which also were discovered and not invented, might have taught them better, not to mention the patterns of behavior in biology. Just as numbers and instinctual forms do exist, so there are many other natural configurations or types which are exemplified by Levi Bruel's representation collectives. They are not metaphysical speculations, but, as we would expect, symptoms of the uniformity of Homo sapiens. Today there is such a large and varied literature describing psychotherapeutic experiences and the psychology of the unconscious that everyone has had an opportunity to familiarize himself with the empirical findings and the prevailing theories about them. This is not true of alchemy, most accounts of which are vitiated by erroneous assumptions that it was merely the precursor of chemistry. Herbert Silberer was the first to try to penetrate its much more important psychological aspects so far as his somewhat limited equipment allowed him to do. Owing to the paucity of modern exposition and the comparative inaccessibility of the sources, it is difficult to form an adequate conception of the problems of philosophical alchemy. It is the aim of the present work to fill this gap. As is indicated by the very name which he chose for it, the spiguric art, or by the oft-repeated saying, solvet coagula, to dissolve and coagulate. The alchemist saw the essence of his art in separation and analysis on the one hand, and synthesis and consolidation on the other. For him, there was first of all an initial state in which opposite tendencies or forces were in conflict. Secondly, there was the great question of a procedure which would be capable of bringing the hostile elements and qualities, once they were separated, back to unity again. The initial state, named the chaos, was not given from the start but had to be sought for as the prima materia, and just as the beginning of the work was not self-evident, so to an even greater degree was its end. There are countless speculations on the nature of the end state, all of them reflected in its designations. The commonest are the ideas of its permanence, prolongation of life, immortality, incorruptibility, its androgyny its spirituality and its corporality, its human qualities and resemblance to man or the homunculus and its divinity. The obvious analogy in the psychic sphere to this problem of opposites is the dissociation of the personality brought about by the conflict of incompatible tendencies, resulting as a rule from an inharmonious disposition. The repression of one of the opposites leads only to a prolongation and extension of the conflict, in other words, to a neurosis. The therapist therefore confronts the opposites with one another and aims at uniting them permanently. The images of the goal which then appear in dreams often run parallel with the corresponding alchemical symbols. An instance of this is familiar to every analyst. The phenomena of the transference which 
corresponds to the motif of the chemical wedding. To avoid overloading this book, I devoted a special study to the psychology of the transference, using the alchemical parallels as a guiding thread. Similarly, the hints or representations of wholeness or the self which appear in the dreams also occur in alchemy as the numerous synonyms for the Lapis Philosophorum, which the alchemists equated with Christ. Because of its greater importance, this last relationship gave rise to a special study, Ion. Further offshoots from the theme of this book are my treatises, The Philosophical Tree, Synchronicity, and A Causal Connecting Principle, and Answer to Job. The first and second parts of this work are devoted to the theme of the opposites and their union. The third part is an account of and commentary on an alchemical text, which evidently written by a cleric, probably dates from the 13th century, and discloses a highly peculiar state of mind in which Christianity and alchemy interpenetrate. The author tries, with the help of the mysticism of the Song of Songs, to fuse apparently heterogeneous ideas, partly Christian and partly derived from natural philosophy in the form of a hymn-like incantation. This text is called Aurora Consurgens, also Aurora Hora, and traditionally it is ascribed to St. Thomas Aquinas. It is hardly necessary to remark that Thomas historians have always reckoned it, or wanted to reckon it, among the spurious and false writings, no doubt because of the traditional depreciation of alchemy. This negative evaluation of alchemy was due, in the main, to ignorance. People did not know what it meant to its adepts because it was commonly regarded as mere gold making. I hope I have shown in my book, Psychology and Alchemy, that properly understood it was nothing of the sort. Alchemy meant a very great deal to people like Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon and also to St. Thomas Aquinas. We have not only the early testimony of Zosimos and Panopolis from the 3rd century, but that of Petrus Bonus and Ferreira from the beginning of the 14th century which both point to the parallelism of the alchemical arcanum and the god-man. Aurora Consurgence tries to amalgamate the Christian and alchemical view, and I have therefore chosen it as an example of how the spirit of medieval Christianity came to terms with alchemical philosophy and as an illustration of the present account of the alchemical problem of opposites. Today, once again, we hear Tendentia's voices still contesting the hypothesis of the unconscious, declaring that it is nothing more than the personal prejudice of those who make use of the hypothesis. Remarkably enough, no consideration is given to the proofs that have been put forward. They are dismissed on the ground that all psychology is nothing more than a preconceived subjective opinion. It must be admitted that probably no other field of work is there so great a danger of the investigators falling a victim to its own subjective assumptions. He of all people must remain more than ever conscious of his personal equation. But, young as the psychology of unconscious processes may be, it has nevertheless succeeded in establishing certain facts which are gradually gaining general acceptance. One of these is the polaristic structure of the psyche, which it shares with all natural processes. Natural processes are phenomena of energy, constantly arising out of the less probable state of polar tension. This formula is of special significance for psychology because the conscious mind is usually reluctant to see or admit the polarity of its own background, although it is precisely from there that it gets its energy. The psychologist has only just begun to feel his way into this structure, and it now appears that the alchemistical philosophers made the opposites in their union one of the chief objects of their work. In their writings, certainly, they employed a symbolical terminology that frequently reminds us of the language of dreams, concerned as these often are with the problem of opposites. Since conscious thinking strives for clarity and demands unequivocal decisions, it 